last fall when we were when we were uh, gathering our speakers for the convention. We weren't sure if Dr. Forbes was going to be able to make it, and uh, it was it was uh, great news when we heard that he was able to. Dr. Forbes. Dixie Alley to some extent, 
being the, the most dominant. Now, what I've done is gone through and just calculated all tornadoes from uh, the past 20 years, sort of a uniform time period when the National Weather Service is going out and doing uh, disaster sur uh, damage surveys. So I've looked at the time frame from 1994, there's my neuropathy fingers there, 1994 to 2013, and I just went through a sampling of cities there, probably about 75 of them, which city has the most tornado bombs. And I thought maybe Oklahoma City, what I've done here is normalized to a 10 point scale. The, the city that had the most get to 10, that had no tornado miles, it got a zero. Oklahoma City, Norman area deep came in with an eight, be Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Huntsville areas, seven, five, eight numbers are pretty big, but I was really surprised the metro area that came out number one was Little Rock. They're the one on here that's got a 10. Uh, I'll come back and talk in detail about Colorado coming up. So I thought that was kind of interesting. There's very, lo very much localized variations. We know there are tornado alleys, mini tornadoes, alleys within many states. So I've actually set about looking at some of those, and it turns out it's very much uh, topographically related. For example, Atlanta uh, shows up uh, with up to a 7.6 in one of the adjacent counties. So I set out starting to do a few more, trying to fill in the gap for the whole U.S. with, with a few more extras thrown in there, and and uh, and then I started getting interesting in the terrain. So. Uh, this is not a, a 33 around Dallas, it's a 3 for Fort Worth and a 3 for the, for the Dallas area. Uh, the Denver number comes in at a, at a 1 on this national 10 point scale. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tornado mileage numbers uh, and, and maybe uh, that that's not quite right. So we'll, we'll take a look at some of these in a little bit more detail. So in Colorado, where's the location with the most tornadoes per square mile and then more to the point, where are the most tornadoes, miles of tornadoes, mileage reported in Colorado. So in terms of the number of tornadoes per square mile, it's a pretty big bullseye. You've heard about the reasons why the Denver cyclone, many of you are probably chasing there. Adams County is a pretty big number. If compared to some of the others up around Boulder, it's pretty close to zero. Uh, El Paso County, uh, the, the, these isopless here, uh, are uh, a five on that national peak 10 point scale. And so there's a lot of Northeast Colorado's above a two. The average for the country is sort of in the one to two range. So this part of Northeast Colorado is a little above the national average with a, a five out of the 10 for Adams County and sort of Kiowa County there in the two to three range for the number of tornadoes per square mile reported. And you go to that tornado mileage and it really is a bullseye. Adams County uh, there with, with the most, with the two on the, on the relative to the 10 for Little Rock and Kiowa County with a two. Now that we've heard about on the, the Palmer Ridge jutting out there from west to east, and then in the southeast flow, it's sort of like on a windy day, the little eddy of leaves that may blow around behind your house. Uh, that's sort of the analogy here. You get the cyclone that sets up in the leaves of the Palmer Ridge that can, can focus some tornadoes, uh, tornado development and, and the rotation source for the tornadoes once the thunderstorm is formed there. So this is probably not surprising you. Uh, and uh, talking a little bit more about some of this in more detail, Adams County is the winner. The Denver cyclone and the convergence zone related to the Palmer Ridge. But the next part maybe gets into burrowing down a little bit more into the data, and maybe that that data isn't correct. And we've heard a little bit about a request from the National Weather Service, and I'm going to give it independently here. 56 of the 67 tornadoes reported in Adams County. Adams County had a half mileage of a tenth of a mile. I don't really think that's probably correct. What I think is happening is that there's been a picture or someone has reported a tornado, nothing to damage, no damage survey done, nothing damaged, so it just gets reported a short brief and gets put in there as a tenth of a mile path. Were they really that short? Maybe if you could time out how many minutes you were watching the tornado. 
while it was on the ground, report that information. The Weather Service would use that or correlate that to then the track because if there's nothing to damage, they can't track it. Maybe we'll get a little bit better information then on the duration and the, the longevity and, and essentially the mileage of tornadoes uh, that may be occurring. So maybe something you can help sort of another time you heard today about helping out with the tornado climatology and verification on the, on the, uh, by the National Weather Service. Of course, there's all sorts of things that influence the damage and, and, and the reporting of that. Population density influences whether the structure's there to, to damage and so on. Then I wanted to look a little bit about that path mileage maximum near Little Rock. And uh, because that really surprised me. Uh, since then, as I've been going around and looking on a county by county basis, I found one higher value, Madison County, Cliff back there in Barron, display lives there. That's, uh, that's the place that wins in the country so far that I found with the, with the most mileage. It actually now gets 11 on the scale of 10 that I had originally uh, started out going. <laughs> Not a good thing. But, uh, so, going back to Arkansas though, and again a terrain map. And these are the number of tornadoes. And I've highlighted there the, the Corridor. So there's Arkansas's mini tornado alley. It's not down in the flat, flatter southeast part of the state. Of course, it's not right up in the heart of the mountains either, as you would probably not expect to happen. But it's a pretty darn well correlated to the edge of the mountains there. Now, and it's not all just the, the highest populated areas. Little Rock is, is the highest one uh, in there. But there's some pretty big numbers that are coming right up along the edge of the terrain. What I think is happening there is that you've got the southeast winds coming in. They get a little bit of extra convergence as they start to hit the terrain. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of a shifting in the wind direction that gives a little bit more rotation. And with the extra lifting and the upper level flow from the southwest, the, the storms there like to run up right up along that lifting track and, uh, and give that a little border. So it's probably a combination of several factors there, but I do think that it's pretty much related to the terrain, but it's interesting that it's on the gradient, on the edge of the terrain, rather than in that flatter area up there. You would think it would be the Mississippi River Valley, where there's lots of real deep moisture, but that's not the case at all. Uh, it is, uh, and that's the number of tornadoes per square mile. It's pretty much the same. It's a little bit more detail, but there is that uh, 140 value would correspond to, to Little Rock with the the 10 value, that was the highest I had found up until uh, just a couple of days ago. And again, that maximum quarter, seven on the 10 point scale, is sort of a little banana shaped quarter there, right up along the edge of the terrain. So that's kind of interesting. Separately interesting, you sort of this little valley here, and then it goes right up into the higher terrain of Northwest. And there's a little bit of a secondary max in there also, 88 value, an actual tornado miles per 10,000 square miles and try to normalize the, the county mileage. A minimum down here in the in the lower terrain areas. So definitely uh, something uh, very interesting there. I had to go do and now go to my, my home state. It's been pretty well known that there's a tornado alley up in the northwest part of the state and the terrain map in here. Atlanta is within this sort of funny looking oblong northwest County, the heart of Atlanta is right in there. So it's not the bullseye of number of tornadoes, it's not in the heart of the highest population, but it's in this quarter, right up again, sort of right up to the south edge of the terrain, down a little bit of maybe on the edge of the terrain in here. And uh, I went back. If we, that's the number of tornadoes, there's another little bit of a bullseye, sort of another little plateau and then down into the lower terrain, a little bit of a secondary tornado reporting maximum there, right down near the Gulf and in the low areas, much less in terms of any bullseyes. And the tornado miles shows up really strongly up in this little valley and up right up against the edge of the terrain there with uh, a maximum. That little secondary plateau I talked about, a little banana kind of quarter there of a maximum. And even another little plateau here for the third one, so, and even here, there's a little bit of an edge of the terrain coming in there, and another little maximum along there. So, so far, every place I've been looking, it's 
sort of edges where it might be a little extra convergence, a little bit of shifting winds, edges of high terrain areas that seem to be explaining some of the, what have been known to be little tornado alleys. Want to look at Alabama, look at Tennessee, look at some of the other locations. I'm going through these pretty carefully. I found some sort of nasty errors in some of the storm data. One that was intended to be 300 yards was actually listed as a 300 mile path, which <laughs> as you can imagine would uh, throw off my data. So I'm going at this on a pretty individualized instead of just a blank computer processing mode. So back to the uh, last year and, and, uh, and, and some, of, some of that. Uh, it was a quiet year, as I pointed out. In fact, three of the, the last three years have been among the quietest on record. If you try to go through and normalize how many tornadoes would have been expected uh, to 2014, about two-thirds of the average. 2013, not much better than that. 1963 jumps in there, then 2012, about 70%. 1950, I, I don't really know, that would be actually number one, but this, that was sort of the first year of statistics taking and how to even figure out what would be normal at that point is pretty hard to do, so uh, that one will, will leave off. Why might 2014 have been, been so quiet? Well, it was certainly uh, one factor. This is the surface air temperature anomaly, the departure from average for the whole year as a whole, and blue and purple lavender colors in here would be below average see pretty much the whole tornado belt of the United States from the front range of the Rocky Mountains over to the Appalachians was below average temperature-wise. So cooler temperatures, less cape, uh, makes some sense. Of course, on a day -day, there can be exceptions on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're talking about the year uh, being a below average, and, and this goes along with that. Another thing we might look at would be, say, the heard earlier today about the, the low-level shear, well, 850 millibar winds, that's, that's sort of up about 5,000 feet over above sea level. And so if those winds are not fast from the south or southwest, uh, you uh, don't have as a favorable shear situation. And this was for the month of May, which was one of those below average months. And uh, these are the anomalies. And if you look carefully, the little, uh, little arrows on there, show that the anomalies over May is prime time in tornado, uh, in the dry line tornado belt, and instead of having faster than average winds from the south, they were either slower or maybe even at times in the north. I think this just means that they were slow. So we did not have that on average, that rip roaring low level jet that was blasting up along the dry line. And that certainly helps cut down the tornadoes as well. If you look even a little bit more carefully, probably some of that flow was continental maybe that, uh, well, I guess it, it's sort of a big ridge that's showing up in here maybe that, that was over the center part of the U.S. at, at low levels. So what about, uh, what about 2015? Uh, someone was asked earlier and was wise enough to guess from the Storm Prediction Center and wise enough not to answer definitively and I'm not going to answer definitively either. <laughs> because as, as uh, Rich Thompson pointed out, though we don't know the answer, at least I don't, uh, but maybe a couple of things that may play into it. Of course, the, the current pattern with all this northwest flow we've been having is not very favorable. The Climate Prediction Center predicts uh, 700 millibar height anomalies for March and let's see, there is the United States. So this is showing a, a low heights up over the James Bay, Hudson Bay area, high heights over the Pacific West Coast. So that means if there's low to the north and east, the high to the southwest, that means northwest flow continuing right down into the central and even southeast states uh, in March. So uh, if this verifies, March is probably going to be kind of quiet as well. Uh, another factor here is that climatologically, depending on the phase of El Nino Southern Oscillation, uh, the winter months have been favored for more, a more active tornadoes when we're in La Nina. Well, we're in neutral conditions, so that is not been favorable. What the past has shown, though, that some of the largest outbreaks uh, have shown an increased uh, tendency when we're in these neutral phase in the, in the May to December time frame. So, Maybe that will encourage things to get going a little bit come May. Uh, the other factor that we might look at 
is the ongoing drought, uh, and uh, th there is a correlation. It, years that are a little bit on the dry side, it, in areas tend to have uh, a little bit more tornado activity, as opposed to if they're real wet and too cloudy. So this may help things a little bit. It may shift things a little bit. I would think that right in the heart of the drought, uh, the caps are a little bit stronger, so maybe shifts to the edge over into the eastern Kansas and, and over into Arkansas and eastern Texas. But again, each of these are factors that uh, can be easily overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day synoptic weather pattern. So uh, there's no perfect uh, prediction, I think, from this. So a lot of the time in 2014, I, I was uh, covering some of the storms, didn't feel up to covering a few of the others. So some of what I've done in the off season here has been to, to look back at a couple of cases and, and, uh, and see, see what I can learn about some of those. The, the biggest days in 2014, some of the biggest days were pretty well done compared to some of the previous years, but uh, 50 tornadoes on April 28th, and you can read the rest of them. The deadliest days, back-to-back uh, -back days, the, including the Bologna, Arkansas day there on April 27th. One of the things I wanted to look at was learn more about the tornado debris signature in, uh, in, in radar. So a lot of what I'll look at uh, coming up here will be sort of a, a look at how the debris signature and other signatures were behaving in, in a few cases of half time. I'm going to do a couple of big day cases and a couple of I would have never predicted a tornado on this day kind of thing if, if I have time. It was, there's one of them I have time. It wasn't even lightning. But yet there was an EF2 tornado. So let's see how far we can, can get. Uh, this one I think you're familiar with, probably the, the storm of the year, the curiosity factor, maybe the, the storm of a lifetime, is a Pilger Day with simultaneous violent tornadoes just a few miles apart, uh, sort of next uh, rotation down the line. Uh, and uh, Reed Timmer here took a pretty spectacular photograph with the damage done and the tornadoes still in progress. Uh, so this was a day in which Poker, uh, Nebraska is up here in east central Nebraska. If you've watched me over the, uh, to northeast Nebraska, if you've watched me over the years, you, you know that I like to be looking up. If it's going to be a, a, you know, a kind of tornado that makes news headlines, it's often up around the warm front. And certainly in the warm, this was zero Z, so this is pretty close to the time of the event, as close as I can get at any of these 12-hour analyses, there's a warm front up in the area. So a warm front forcing is there. A lot of very warm, moist air coming into the south of that. At 8.50, there's a 40-knot jet going from the surface, pretty strong uh, south-southeasterlies to south-southwesterlies, a uh, quarter coming up there. And then the 500 millibars, the upper feature, not real well defined. It's a bit to the south and west. And at 300, uh, the feature is still pretty far to the west. Uh, but there is some upper level divergence, a little bit of difluence uh, taking place over the area. So not every feature is, is huge, but certainly the low level portions of that are. The, uh, the sounding, a special sounding taken at 19Z just before the tornado from Omaha. Huge amounts of cave, huge amounts of positive area on the sounding. <laughs> Whoops, you can't... Uh, hardly ask for a hodograph that has a, a better turning profile there. Huge amounts of felicity swept out there between these blue lines. And thing that's catching my eye on some of this, the super, supercell parameter that we've heard talked about, it's not in those two or three or five. I don't know that I've ever seen a supercell parameter bigger than 60. That's, uh, that's pretty huge. And a significant tornado parameter for the effective layer close to 14. So those compared to sort of the climatology, they're peaking at the top of the chart, the, the highest that, that they can get. Uh, the zero Z is sounding then, just near or just a little bit after. So, some changes, you see that the, uh, the, the helicity has gone down. It's a little bit post sounding. And big changes to this one, the supercell parameter down to three. So changes in time, changes, subtle changes in location relative to some of these features uh, can make for 
Uh, and this one, in this case, you got into that air slot for the warm front, it was much different than if you were right up there in the warm front area. And we know what happened, uh, sort of a cycling, uh, uh, unusual, well, at least very interesting pattern on radar that set up an EF-4 tornado, then a pair of Pilgrim tornadoes, and then followed by a fourth tornado, all of which rated the EF-4. The, the two of them close together, showing a little bit of evidence of Fujiwara effect, interacting with each other, revolving, maybe revolving about each other a little bit. And uh, we'll take a look at, at some of this. If you watch, the, watch me, you know, I like looking at a radar, and we're going to do a lot of that here for the, for the rest of the presentation. Uh, what I'll try to do here are put together, combine a, a slide that has various fields. We usually have the, the lowest scan reflectivity, in this case showing for the Stanton time, the first of these tornadoes, a uh, hook echo with maybe what's a little bit of a golden debris ball here. The tornado, the storm relative velocity is showing, yeah. and the green, the Gibson Ridge Triangle showing the tornado vortex signature with that in the red and the green. And then as I mentioned, I wanted to sort of look at the behavior of the debris signature in that. And so that'll be, that'll be showing up here uh, with uh, the uh, already a debris signature. You can see there's the green triangle, the debris signature, these low correlation coefficients indicating the tumbling of the debris as opposed to these bright red values that are sort of the, the rain and this big raindrops that are falling uh, more flattened uh, or at least maintaining <coughs> similar kind of shapes. So the green triangle down to the debris ball kind of signature, there's a tornado debris signature showing up in that one for sure. Uh, going a few minutes later, the storm is cycling. Probably you're well aware of the supercells tend to cycle, the rear flank downdraft wraps around, if it chokes off the warming flow, the tornado starts to make a bit of a left turn, and uh, as it's carried more by the mean winds instead of right propagating. The next uh, tornado though in the family sort of tends to form down in the right side, just to the east of where the rear flank downdraft is has come in, and so the next tornado is forming here. This will be the Pilgrim tornado down to the south and east of Stanton. The Stanton tornado there is still in progress, a little bit of debris ball, very well defined debris signature in the upper right with that, and then uh, very well, this is a normalized rotation. It's sort of looking at the change of the velocity. It's the gate to gate shear magnitude, if you will, and a pretty strong storm tornado there up near the, uh, has formed down uh, with the already at the beginning of the Pilger tornado, but at this point does not have a tornado debris signature. So either it's over a uh, field or it's debris has to gotten up high enough that the radar can see it at this point. So that's 58. We'll go about uh, what, nine minutes later and up in the upper left there, there's the remnants, it's made a left turn, there's the old Stanton tornado, still has the debris signatures getting elongated, still has its vortex signature, but it's getting a little weaker. Now, right around at the gold tri uh, at the yellow triangle symbol is the, is the Pilker tornado, it's the first, the first one, well defined, and it's beginning to pick up a little bit of a debris signature at this point. That elongated feature though, I think, well, we, we start getting this whole elongated structure, this banded structure to the feature. Some of that may be related to the extra forcing that's up around the warm front. I think the rear flank diagraph will kick around and also give sort of another boundary that complicates things. Things really start to get interesting. We, we get these in Nebraska from time to time. You get these a whole row of features, one, two, three, that look like candidates for maybe having tornadoes in. In this case, the, the northwest one is the one that's part of the original Stanton tornado. The southeast one is the one that now is a pretty well-defined Pilbert tornado. Reference relative to the yellow triangle. The debris ball is north and west of the yellow triangle. The debris signature, that's the first Pilbert tornado, is big and uh, bigger in the 
embracing into the debris wall itself. So some of the debris is falling out toward Pilbara ahead of the tornado. And then in this normalized rotation, there's two signatures. One that's Pilbara tornado number one. This is probably about the time of that dual tornado photo that we saw. Tornado number two is showing up. It doesn't have a debris wall yet. And it doesn't have the debris signature yet either at this time. That was uh, at 12 minutes after. At 15 minutes after, what that's happening is the roof line downdraft is coming around and getting a whole line, a shear line, that is uh, shifting winds, maybe a little bit more west component to the left of this line that is set up. The still the southeast ahead of that, so we're getting shear that's along that that's setting up more than one circulation. As far as I know, there wasn't any tornado in that middle lump, but there's one here, Pilbara one and two are in each of these features. And both